trustee. I just love having a tech support person. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. I'm Paul Stacey, the Executive Director of Open Education Global. And it's been my uh, great delight, actually, to be able to host such a convening of the global open education community and see uh, friendly faces that I've known for a while and also meet new people. And so I just want to welcome you to today's uh, webinar. Delighted to have uh, some really great sessions from, from Marinda, Carolyn, and Jerry coming up. I'll let them introduce themselves in just a sec, but just to orient you, we're running this session similar to the other webinars. Uh, this session um, has elements of it that are related to the UNESCO OER recommendation action areas of inclusive and equitable open education resources, as well as building capacity. And so we'll hear a nice mix of uh, presentations that address both those action areas. Um, I invite those of you who have joined us in this session to introduce yourself in chat, uh, maybe say where you're from and your interest in this particular session as a means of giving us some of your, your interests and your background. We will, and of course, invite the use of chat for questions and comments. So please feel free to add anything at any time. I'll keep an eye on the chat window and bring up questions and comments as appropriate. I will also monitor timings. Basically these presentations are intended to be about 20 minutes long. Um, we normally have up to five of these in one webinar. We, we have three today. So there, there may be some opportunity for some handling of the questions and comments as they arise during the webinar. And I'll try to, try to manage that, uh, but we'll also keep a nice chunk of time at the end for discussion with all of the presenters today. And, and, and then of course, invite further discussion in the Open Education Global Connect platform for this particular webinar. And that's great space, space for follow on discussion. Um, so with that, and I thank you for these introductions that are happening and thanks Liz for posting a link to it. Um, why don't I invite um, the three of you to introduce yourselves and then we'll start with Jerry Hanley who's actually doing two presentations. So we'll have one from him first and then we'll switch to the others and then come back to Jerry. But Carolyn, Marinda, do you wanna introduce yourselves first? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. So nice to be here with you. I'm Carolyn Sinkinson. I am a teaching and learning librarian and one of the OER leads at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And I'm here today with Marinda. And I'm Marinda McClure. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the health and human sciences librarian. And like Carolyn, one of the OER leads at the University of Colorado Boulder. Thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us. What a beautiful place. Jerry? Yeah, and hi everyone. My name's Jerry Hanley. Um, I'm a recovering administrator uh, from the California <laughs> State University system. Um, for 20 years, I was the assistant vice chancellor for academic technology. And I had the great pleasure of working with all our libraries. We provided the library infrastructure services. So. Carolyn and Marinda, this is great, Librarians Rock. Um, and I also did lots of other stuff there um, in providing uh, digital resources for our 23 campuses serving a half a million students. And then my, my night job was uh, Executive Director of Merlot. Um, been doing that since the start, 1997. And um, in uh, 2014, we kicked off Skills Commons, which is an open education repository for workforce development. And that was a great opportunity. I got to meet Paul during that process. And I uh, just wanna thank uh, you, Paul, and also the OE global community for uh, inviting me to participate today. Very good. You, Administrators Anonymous, it sort of sounds oh. like um, a recovery program. Um, yes. All right. Uh, well, look, let's get underway with the presentations. Jerry, um, I'll turn it over to you, please. I assume you want to share your screen, but uh, I'll invite you now to give your first of two presentations. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And let me just get everything all set. And, and, and if you have questions along the way, feel free to um, 
pop them in the chat and Paul, you're welcome to interrupt me um, okay. at any time along those lines. <clears throat> I'll watch for a Okay, thank you. So um, the first topic is around capturing uh, open educational practices with e-portfolios. And um, what I like to do is um, sometimes it gets kind of confusing and complex of how do all the open resources and practices and services and research and all this other stuff. So I like to use this metaphor to looking at um, education and cooking. And, uh, and, you know, the first part is, you know, when you're about to cook a meal, you need the ingredients, right? And, and when I often look at how, where in your kitchen, cupboard, your larder, whoever, however you have where you store your refrigerator, that having all those ingredients available for you is kind of the first step in order for you to cook. And in, in the open education, those are like our open educational resources that really become the ingredients for the educational processes that, that we want to put in place. Now, ingredients without the recipes really don't go very far, right? And so the recipes are really important. It's the know-how that you have about how to prepare this, that customize it particularly for what you're trying to do and the skills of you organizing those ingredients in various ways. And, and within the open education framework, I refer to those, you know, as many other people do, what are the open educational practices? Now, I can have the recipes and I can have the ingredients, but if I don't have the kitchen with my, you know, the stove and the mixing bowls that allows me to combine things in different ways and prepare them in different ways, then I really can't prepare those meals. So I, you know, the, all these, the equipment and utensils to enable all these things to be prepared, we can refer to as open educational services. And, and this talk, I'm gonna focus predominantly on the open educational practices. So, uh, so I hope that metaphor is helpful. And, um, and just to, for those who may not be familiar, I'm gonna zip through some of these slides real quick. Um, if you're looking for academically oriented open education resources, Merlot has a lot of uh, resources you can find. Um, in our collection, we have about 95,000 resources that are continually growing. We add about 400 new materials a month. You can type in you know, some keyword if you'd like. You can browse, do lots of things, provide resources. And the other thing that, just, that people may not know is that we also search over 75 other open libraries simultaneously. And so you can actually help the discovery process of where is the ingredients that I can gather from, that I can do my shopping and bring it into my kitchen, Merlot helps you find all those two as well. And so, um, and we're always continually adding additional libraries into this process that then allows you to filter down and search. You can filter by uh, Creative Commons license too as well. So, so you have from the academic side and the workforce development side, Skills Commons, if you're not familiar with that, if you're looking for manufacturing, IT, healthcare, construction, agriculture, professional services, we, we have a lot of stuff about that too as well. Oops, sorry, hit, hit the wrong button there. Am I still sharing screen? Just wanna make sure. Yes, we can still see. Okay, great. So, so coming back to the cooking theme again, if you, you can have all this content, but without the practices, we can't really have the impact that, that, that we have. So, you know, once you have these open resources, how do I teach with them, right? How do I redesign my course and curriculum so my students can succeed by customizing it for their learning and, and the teaching that I do? Or with, with, um, with COVID, when I don't have access to the actual facilities in my labs, how can I teach those virtually? I can have the technologies, I can have the content, but without that, what's the practices? And, and that's really 
one of the things when uh, a number of years ago, when we started looking at the resources that Merlot's community was creating, really, where are the, where can I find the practices? So we created a, an, another kind of website that really focused on the practices and capturing practices with e-portfolios in a sense where you can capture the faculty's voice for if they want to move online or, or an institution to say, what are the strategies that can help you take these open resources and help you move online? So whether it's redesigning a course with technology or trying to reduce the cost by using open education resources. Or in the career and technical area, how do I teach plumbing with the uses of online resources or virtual labs or looking at quality assurance? So we put together, again, we have about a thousand e-portfolios, both from teaching e-portfolios to institutional e-portfolios. And what you can think about what we put together here is just this collection of faculty recipes. So it's a recipe book where you can find these things. And what I'm gonna do is just show you, uh, we'll get out of the, the PowerPoint and, uh, and then I'll, we'll just play a little bit with um, the, uh, the, the e-portfolio um, portal. So, <coughs> excuse me. The, the, the first aspect of, we'll just begin, I'll, I'll give you illustrations of how this works. So, so you can begin to explore all the different types of uh, practices that we've been capturing um, with our faculty. And, and this is the one about in the Cal State University system, we call it our affordable learning solutions program um, that really encourages and enables faculty to change their teaching resources. And so it, let's say, for example, if I'm in business, that's one of the areas, particularly in economics, where those textbooks can be extremely important. And so what we have here are different faculty telling their stories about how they now teach, for example, microeconomics. So at Cal State San Bernardino, in, in the process of providing faculty some support for changing to adopting open education resources, one of the things we've asked them to do is we gave them a template and we asked them to tell their story about how, what resource are they using? And so they give that description of, of in here and what they did on the cost savings and accessibility and things along those lines. And then we also had them Tell, tell us about your course that you're teaching. Because when someone is looking at a resource and then you say, okay, and I'm blanking, I've forgotten on this person's name, where is he? He's down over here. Uh, so Daniel, so when Daniel's teaching microeconomics, someone can say, oh, am I teaching a course? Are there similar learning outcomes, things along those lines? And what are the changes that he, he, he made in, in going through this process and the impact that it might have? And then finally, we asked them to talk about the adoption process itself. What were his reasons? You know, the issues around how he can then customize in the use of the OpenStax textbook and not have a significant impact on, you know, the student feeling like they haven't, um, you know, they bought this $250 book and they're using half of it, right? So, so again, the ability for the faculty to give voice to their role in adopting the open education resources. And so you, you in the, if you wanna think about the change management process of enabling faculty to try new ingredients is what's the recipe that I can deliver a better meal for my students or what's the recipe for me to deliver a better learning experience and have it in their words. So, so we created these templates and I'll show you those in a second. And then we really um, encouraged our faculty to tell their story. And so when, then when we look at encouraging other faculty to say, look at the impact, and it's not me as an administrator trying to tell them the story, but then they can go into science and technology and say, what, what are they doing there? And you know, what are the courses that they're taught teaching and what are the books they're using? 
and who are from your community college to a four-year institution and using all the variety of sources. So, so that's one of the kind of the goals when we're thinking about how you get people to change the ingredients that they're using or the content, the resources, that having these recipes of faculty telling their stories become very important. Now, not only, and, and each one of these e-portfolios are a CC by, or they're a CC by um, share alike. We let the faculty put their own Creative Commons license. So it's the practice now as an open education resource. Um, and that, that became an important element of this. When we also asked them about another program of, all right, let's look at redesigning your courses in various ways with technology. Um, when you had to flip a course or um, use supplemental instruction, and now statistics was one of these classes that we often had many challenges with our students being successful at, and how do you improve their, their um, likelihood of passing that class so they don't have to take it again and delay their graduation. So we had faculty in this program, again, participate in a faculty development program to learn about these things. But then for each one of those, whether it's teaching probability or teaching redesigning their statistics in a criminal justice course, or you know, whatever it might be, um, I mentioned flipping the classroom, we had them again, write, develop an e-portfolio in, uh, in teaching this. Oh, let me click on this again. There we go. And, um, and so he, this is an example of uh, Jison in uh, Cal State LA telling their story around the course that I'm teaching and my strategy and my objectives. I'm just going on the left-hand side, talking about my students, who she is, the issues of accessibility, the resources, and how she's organized this. And, and then on the right-hand side was also, what's the outcome? Well, after you redesign this course, what were the changes that occur in? So Jisun looked at socio-emotional socio measures, cognitive measures, the performance, how many students were more successful in completing the course and blah, blah, blah. So we, and again, this is Jisun's teaching practices of flipping the classroom and finding all these resources that now other faculty looking at redesigning their stat course would now have, have available for them. And, and we put together in this program, we have over 700 um, faculty e-portfolios across a variety of disciplines. Um, and again, when you're thinking about how do you enable the adoption, it's really one chef sharing their recipe with another chef. And this is around one faculty in English or foreign languages or nursing saying, this is what I do. And you may wanna look at how I've done this too as well. So we have on that course redesign aspect, another one talking about career and technical education. Um, this is one of the areas that that you uh, that there are many challenges on in looking on how do you help those students and and here the e portfolios were more and when you're working in career and technical education um, how do you learn to align your curriculum with industry standards so we started doing video interviews with people who ran these programs and how they worked on developing those partnerships. So whether you're in Missouri or Utah, here are again, their stories. We created structured um, interviews captured on video. So you can hear Dawn here or Fred here. And then if you're looking for the actual materials themselves that they used, you can click on this and then it goes to the open education library of materials and so there's 101 learning resources and 143 program support materials related that I can now, now that I know the story around how they did it, now I can get the resources, the ingredients that enabled 
them to be successful in this Missouri uh, STEM WINS program. All right, so on the area of workforce development, trying to help programs think about aligning workforce development, or we also have stories about how do you help students in the career navigation process? Again, student support service. And so these are the recipes that enable student success and making these openly available for you to use and, and captured in the various resources, okay? All right. Um, and then we have pedagogical aspects here. So just wanted to give you a sense of that. Um, Moving online, um, the other aspect is, you know, ha, ha, um, what are all the things you have to think about when you're moving online? And, and these are some of the things we created a portal that aggregated guidance and how do you teach online, uh, guidance, open education resources for how students can use to learn online. And, and with that then, as an, as an open educational portal, then we helped many institutions create derivative versions and think, think of that institutional e-portfolio. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, historically black colleges and universities. We work with technical schools as well, community colleges. And this is just um, a few, we probably put together about 30 of these derivative um, uh, websites for moving online. Um, that are that are available for people to use. And um, let's see. And and I just want to uh, finish up here with a little bit of uh, in demonstrating that this website too is um, where you know are these tools these um, mechanisms and I'll call services for open education resources. Can you use the tools to create your own e-portfolios, whether they're teaching e-portfolios or learning e-portfolios or institutional ones? Well, Merlot has all these available for you. We've created templates that allow you to create um, these on your own, and I can show you those real quick, as well as video videos on how to create it. And so, for example, if you ever wanna create um, your own um, e-portfolios, you go into add and here's create materials and I'll just show you some examples. So we create a lot of uh, templates that you then can use. We can have blank ones and these are all free and open educational resources. Um, and if you want to uh, redesign your, um, uh, um, your course, you click on that template and you can just call it whatever you want. You can say, here's a test. And just to give you an illustration, whoop, hang on one sec. Let's just try that again. Here we go. So here's a, a, a tool that, that then you can, and if you know how to use a um, author in a Word document, you can create a, um, a, a website with, with Malone. So let me go back to the presentation and just finish up with um, a few things here. Just a couple and, more minutes, Jerry. Right, you got it, right. That's why I'm gonna zip through this stuff and let me um, just to show you, oh, there we go. So, so these are all the, the examples uh, we've shown you it. And here's the example of the template that Cal State used um, that for them to create ones, you can create them by disciplines and all the tools, um, the biology and virtual labs. We didn't show you that, but we have tools for those. And then the online versions, the know-how to doing that, we have those available and in career and technical education. So with these free materials, both the ingredients that you have and the recipes, we, we begin to say, how do you cook in with your five R's? You can reuse, redistribute, and retain. And it's like getting the takeout food at people remixing. Oh, you know, the open education tool, Merlot Content Builder, allows you to remix and revise. And so, and we have even a section here about how you can do that too as well. 
So, so these are again, just tools and we have uh, translation tools. So we did this for the Thai, universe, Thai Cyber University and you can translate all these tools and now in Thai. So in conclusion, open education resources with practices and services and you as the chef can really make the difference. So thank you very much. And I hope this is useful uh, for you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and maybe yeah, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, then we'll prepare for the handover. But just before we hand over to Marinda and um, Carolyn, um, maybe just um, be, rather than dive into a long discussion with Jerry right now, I'd just be curious to hear people's immediate reactions. Just what did you think of that? Okay, so if someone thinks it's brilliant, Jerry, compliments to the chef. <laughs> well, it, as you know, it's a community effort, you know, yeah, um, yeah. you can want people to do it, but if they don't tell their story, um, yeah, then it, it stays silent and we lose that knowledge. I, yeah, I like that metaphor too. And, I, and I'll just say, Jerry, that I've always wanted to do a show where we give a group of faculty, let's say two or three faculty, the same ingredients, give them a set amount of time, <laughs> and then have a panel of students who get to taste <laughs> what they cooked up with yeah. their open educational practices, just like they do on Iron Chef television. And uh, <laughs> I think that'd be really fun. I've actually tried to do that, but it didn't, didn't quite happen. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm ready. An OEO, I'll, I'll uh, OE Global Bake Off. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we need the, um, not the cooking channel, but the open education channel. And then- There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so, well, so there's, so there's a really great question here from Esita, but let's hold on to that. But I welcome more questions and remarks while we move on. And then we'll have a big discussion with everybody at the end that would include Jerry's first presentation, the one we're about to see and Jerry's last presentation. We'll have like, a festival of, we'll have a, like a community festival of eating and dialogue. You can get a glass of wine if it's that time of day. <laughs> okay, um, great, thank you, Asita. And so uh, let me turn it over now to Marinda and Carolyn um, and give you the floor. I know you want to share with us about aspiring to care in the open. And this is a topic I personally have a really high interest in. And I really feel like in some ways, Jerry set the stage nicely for you because he's also showing through his initiatives that there's a real intent to care for faculty and how they can approach this. But please, Carolyn, Marinda, over to you. Great, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Jerry. So today we'd like to share with you, as Paul said, a values framework that we continue to develop and we're going to introduce that. Um, but first off, I will say that we're so thrilled to be here with you at OEO, or OE Global, pardon me, and uh, do feel welcome again to mention anything you'd like to in the chat throughout our presentation. We'll try and respond in the end discussion time. I'm Marinda McClure, I'm Health and Human Sciences Librarian and one of the OER leads at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado in the United States. And again, I'm Carolyn Sinkinson, teaching and learning librarian and also OER lead at CU Boulder. So the framework that we've developed communicates values that we wish to center and also realize both as what we consider ways of being in our open education work and also outcomes. We're going to start off by very briefly introducing the framework and its ethics of care foundation. After that, we'll really focus our presentation on sharing our most recent addition to the framework of prompts that we hope will support educator reflection, as well as several local educators' responses to and perspectives and feedback on these prompts. And then we'll invite you to take a few minutes to reflect on how the framework may resonate with you, and we'll speak for, uh, to our plans about how we'll continue developing it. 
So throughout this work that we've iterated over time, a guiding question for us has been and really continues to be, how can we center, communicate, and realize an ethic of care in our open education work? We've come to believe that an ethic and a pedagogy of care are really essential to transforming education through the use of open modalities. We see centering care as really critical to ensuring that open education is inclusive and that it attends to relationships between students, educators, practitioners like ourselves, and other individuals that we engage with in open education work. Care ethics and its theorists have really influenced and inspired us in this framework development work. We've been especially influenced by Bernice Fisher and Joan Tronto, who define care as everything that we do to maintain, continue, and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. For us, we see that this definition really aligns with the commitments of open education to repair access to education and to encourage relationships within open education that are supportive of sharing and of cooperation. Fisher and Toronto outlined four phases of care that have been important and significant in our framework development. These are caring about, take care of, caregiving, and care receiving. And Toronto later emphasized an overarching phase of care with, that is to say, including the particular voices and the perspectives of those we are caring for. Each phase in this model includes both the caregiver and the care receiver. Toronto and Fisher established four ethical qualities as necessary to building reciprocal caring relationships. To approach caring from their perspective requires of us attentiveness, a proclivity to become aware of need, responsibility, a willingness to respond and to take care of need, competence, the skill of providing good and successful care, and responsiveness, consideration of the position of others. Toronto didn't see this as a comprehensive list of ethical dimensions of care, but as ethical qualities that really emphasize the relational aspects of care. So at the highest level, our framework structure and organization is rooted in Joan Toronto's feminist Democrat, democratic ethic of care and inspired by Toronto's broad conceptualization of care as an activity and as a kind of practice. Attentiveness, responsibility, competency, responsiveness, and integrity are the broadest values that we wish to emphasize in our open education work. We draw the first four of these values from Toronto's ethical, pardon me, from Toronto's ethical qualities of care that we just introduced, and we associate the fifth value of integrity with that overarching caring with phase that Toronto introduced later. We expand each of our five broadest values with additional values. So we nest empathy, respect, and inclusivity under attentiveness, for example. In our OE, OE Global 2020 presentation last year, we were delighted to share our first iteration of the framework, which was intended for practitioners such as ourselves. And in this most recent edition, we've added prompts that we hope will support educators' reflection on how they might attend to care in their design or in their redesign of student learning experiences. So for example, here is the educator reflection prompt that we've nested under the top value of attentiveness and then under empathy. It invites an educator to consider how might you gather and elicit students' hesitancy, experiences, their understandings of working in the open. And how might you as an educator actively listen and make visible these really attentive enactments of your listening? Our most recent step has been to conduct conversations with several local educators, where we really try to explore how educators might respond to these prompts and whether they find the prompts spark and support meaningful and also worthwhile reflection for them.
Yeah, so a number of key themes uh, did emerge in our recent conversations with educators. And what was really interesting to us is that the themes that we heard from the educators we interviewed reinforce the perspectives of a lot of the scholars who are engaged in open practices, many of you in this room. Um, we were really struck that while those educators we were interviewing may not have been engaged deeply with that literature or this community, their responses echoed similar sentiments and principles. Um, so that was encouraging to us to see. Many of the prompts that we did craft um, for our framework are in, in invitations for educators to consider and appreciate the experiences and perspectives of learners. And as a result, a salient theme we heard in the responses was the importance of giving students choice and giving them ownership in their learning. For those we interviewed, that was really a means of caring about and noticing learners as agents and actors in their own learning. Um, the teacher quoted on the previous slide and on this slide as well, went on to articulate that by strengthening a sense of agency in students, in classroom settings, we may also be impacting the orientation they take with them out into other contexts as well. Similarly, another educator shared how important it was uh, to build flexibility and options into the design of open educational projects. What's significant about this response and the intention of giving choice is that it recognizes that we need to approach openness critically, asking what form of openness is justifiable and for whom, knowing that that answer, of course, may differ moment to moment and student to student. Another related and important theme that emerged for us was risk and consent. In this quote, you can see the educator shared how important it is and how strongly she felt the responsibility for gathering consent from students. She went on to describe how risk is also not uniform for all of her students. She recognized that each time she or any educator asks a learner to engage in the open, a learner will negotiate that on a very personal level. Um, yet another theme that emerged for us was the importance of transparency and intention behind the assignments designed with an open pedagogical approach. One educator described how she informs students of the whys of the open assignment, the why it's important for their learning, but also how and, and why it might also be important for broader audiences in the open knowledge commons. In many way, uh, ways, of course, this theme connects directly back to the first theme about student choice. By being transparent, we allow students to understand the intention and then to make informed decisions about their own participation in those activities. A fourth theme that we were really pleased to hear relates to shifting and resisting inherited hierarchical relationships between educators and students. And in this quote, the educator is talking about that while it may take courage, he really enjoys admitting to students his own uncertainty or unknowing and that as we thought more about this, right, the, the realities of schooling do mean power. It does exist in teacher student relationships. But what these educators shared with us are strategies for signaling to students that curiosity, inquiry, and learning are shared goals for both the teacher and the learner. Um, and in this quote, um, what we're trying to capture is that by joining students co collaboratively and cooperatively for learning, a teacher can step into a place of um, joining students in a mutual quest for learning. And this for us is another really important aspect of open pedagogy to invite students to approach unresolved and authentic problems alongside their teachers and to design content that gives space for students to add their own voice to those solutions um, and new knowledge. Um, let's see. Um, 
Yeah, the um, in this quote, the educators' responses uh, also address the critical role of reciprocal empathy in teaching and learning. Uh, this particular educator reflected on striving for a, a place of empathy to create a safe space for students that's free of racism, classism, and sexism, and other barriers and things that get in the way of student engagement. For him, he shared a very um, individual approach that he takes at the outside of every uh, the first day of all of his classes he shares with students how important he feels empathy to be for himself and for others he invites them to cultivate an empathetic orientation toward other human beings and goes on to tell him why that's important he shares that he thinks this is a disposition or a skill that's both important here now in this classroom but also elsewhere in educational workplace, social, and personal context. Um, for this educator, we really heard from him that this is an important aspect of his design of learning scenarios, but he also anticipates how important it will be for students as they appreciate diverse lived experiences as they're working in the open. So those were some of the, the themes that we heard just emerge from our first few interviews. Um, we also, in as a whole, started to gather some insights about their responses. So just looking back to where we started and where we've come from, we originally designed the framework with a number of aims in mind, and these included strongly establishing an ethical foundation for our open education work rooted in an ethic of care, also reminding ourselves and others who we work with and interact with in open education about the values that we aspire to realize in this work and guiding our own decision making and our design of professional development for educators on our campus that's related to open educational practices and open pedagogy. Our addition for prompts um, of prompts for educators most recently really aims to support their critical reflection on attending to care in their design or their redesign of learning experiences that specifically engage students in open. And our conversations with educators recently suggested to us that the framework can indeed serve as a catalyst for their reflective thinking, and we were delighted to find that this is the case. But it did also provide us with a number of suggestions and insights that we'd like to explore further. So in addition to finding the prompts uh, helpful for reflection generally and individually, the educators readily could imagine using these prompts for more specific or targeted purposes. For example, they might use them to critically reconsider their implementation of a specific course assignment or a project where they've engaged students in open practices. They also imagine that using the prompts for shared reflection with peers, such as in a workshop setting, could be enjoyable and generative in a very different way than the prompts were useful to them for their individual reflection. These insights really encourage us to look a little more closely in additional conversations with educators about how we might be able to provide guidance or support or scaffolding for educators to use these prompts in different ways for different purposes and in different settings, both individually and communally. We were also really struck by this educator's comment. She appreciated that one of the prompts made her aware of concepts that she hasn't considered yet. And it shifted in her um, perspective how she'll continue thinking about and mulling over uh, and exploring open practices with students. So what this has led us to think about more is further exploring how educators may differently experience these prompts, depending on factors such as the extent to which they have or haven't explored open pedagogy, their institutional context, and the flexibility or the inflexibility of their curriculum, for example. Overall, we found and learned that educators' perspectives and feedback in these initial conversations really reminded us that as Joan Tronto writes, caring is an ongoing practice and it's influenced by situational conditions. So the really active practice of care requires a reflexive approach 
And it also requires of educators a willingness to analyze and shift strategies. We are really excited to continue developing the framework. And to do that, we look forward to engaging a broader community of educators to help inform this work. Yeah, and, and part of that for us, and, and since the beginning when we started working on this framework, um, something that's really important to us is to hear from others, from colleagues like yourselves, about how they are responding and what it is they see in the framework. And indeed, last year at OE Global, we shared the earlier iteration um, of this framework and during that session invited attendees to respond with words or phrases that to them capture the essence of care. And this is a snapshot of that answer garden and those responses last year as a way of illustrating to you that these actually really did inform um, our work and consecutive drafts and iterations on the framework. And so with that kind of in mind, if we have time, Paul, um, we wanted to take a few minutes now and invite your responses to this version of the framework. Um, to facilitate that, what we have done is created a Padlet that we can throw in the chat now. The Padlet includes a few columns with a number of the educator prompts from the framework on there. Um, and we'd like to invite you to, to take a look at those and take a few minutes to, oh, thank you, Miranda, take a few minutes to respond to those. Now, there are many, many prompts on that Padlet. By no means are we expecting you to look at or even attempt to answer all of them. Instead, we'd encourage you to maybe um, see if there's one that strikes or, or grabs your attention immediately and just take a few moments to share some responses. Um, and it, you need not be worried about how formulated or unformulated your responses are now. Um, anything that you might wish to share would be beneficial to us. And we'll give it, uh, if it's all right, Paul, four or five minutes for people to respond. Yeah, that's great. Let's do this. Okay. A little bit of quiet time and reflection on these Padlet prompts. I think um, if you could at least respond to one or two in that time, it'd be awesome. Go ahead. To share with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Those are such rich comments. And if you have other comments um, that are sort of annotative of our framework or um, thoughts or feedback, we'd welcome you to just add those to the Padlet as well. This is really rich. So to close uh, just briefly, we'd like to talk about our vision for moving forward and our next steps for ongoing participatory development and design of the framework using input such as you're sharing with us today and um, the educators that we're speaking to in individual interviews are giving us to think about as well. This is a roadmap of where we started and where we're going. Uh, we began with an exploration of care theories and as we've shared, we first drafted a framework of values that was very much inspired by Toronto and Fisher. We added examples of practitioner enactments. And to do that, we drew on concrete experiences from our work in open education, as well as our aspirations. And we shared this first draft at OE Global 2020 last year. And then most recently, we've added framework prompts, which you've now seen a little bit more of to support educator reflection. And we piloted interviews about these prompts with several local educators. So now we're excited to look at interviewing a broader community of educators and learning more about the different ways that they respond to um, and might see room for improvement and refinement of these prompts. We're also going to explore some of their themes and suggestions that emerged in those pilot interviews. For example, um, their interest in seeing how the framework prompts might be used for reflection in community with their peers. 
So we'll plan to continue revising and refining the framework given what we learn, and we're hoping to test and strengthen it by using it actively in our open education work with educators this year. The framework is available at this site. We invite you to explore it. And in addition to the thoughts that you've shared on the Padlet today, please always feel welcome to reach out to us with any additional reactions, observations, suggestions, or feedback you might have. And then to close today, we just want to give you an opportunity to respond to an answer garden that we'll put in the chat. Um, here, we'd like to ask you in 40 characters or less, what are you taking away from our time today? So this should be a very brief moment of reflection before we close and go on to Jerry's second presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today, giving us the opportunity to share this with you and contributing to our continued work. Yeah, thank you. Let's give people a minute or so to respond to your last answer garden link. That is a great suggestion. So I'll be quiet if people can say a few words. Okay. Well, look, let's leave, let's leave both the Padlet and the Answer Garden just open and people can continue to add if more things come to mind. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Marinda. Really a deeply felt and moving session from my perspective on the importance of care, uh, something I think all ed open educators really believe in. And it's nice to see it expressed in such a thoughtful and carefully articulated way. Thank you. Okay, so we'll leave the Padlet and the Answer Garden open. We'll continue to leave them open right to the very end of this webinar so people can jump back and forth and add to it. As maybe they'll get more additions during the discussion that will follow this last presentation. Um, so um, uh, we are now going to go back to invite Jerry to, to uh, talk to us about serving stone soup um and uh and more lessons from the world of merlot and his work with open educational services over to you jerry unmute there we go <laughs> thank you paul and uh and caroline and marinda just terrific i i think um what you're doing and the the drive to bring empathy back into education um, is so important and and 
maybe some of the stuff that where we talk about how do we serve stone soup um, might be um, bring in some of your themes, I, I think here. Um, so let me just, I'll start off with, um, oh, hang on one second, here we go. So I'm gonna start off with, with the story of stone soup. And um, so over 60 years ago, I remember hearing this story as a child and, um, and many of you may know it, many of you may not. So I'm gonna to try to give a, a kind of a brief telling of this because this also becomes really a metaphor for thinking about open education, open pedagogy um, and um, and also about change manage, excuse me, change management. So um, the story goes, um, at the end of the 17th century, there were three soldiers coming back from the, the war. They were tired and they were hungry and just wanted to get home. And as they're walking down uh, the path, they see a village ahead and they go, oh, wonderful, a village. Maybe they'll provide us some food and some drink and you know, let us sleep in a nice bed for once. And so they start walking down. Now, the mayor out in the town square looks up and he says, oh no, soldiers are coming. Quick, everyone hide your food because we know that's what they're gonna want. So this, the townspeople you know, hustle out and try to hide everything. And the soldiers come into the, to the village and they see the mayor and they go, mayor, we're tired and we're hungry. Do you just have a bit of food or a little drink just for three poor soldiers trying to make their way home? And the, and the mayor bends over and says, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. We've had such a poor harvest. We have nothing, nothing to give, but the next town over has something for you. You should keep on going on. And, the, and then one of the, the first soldier goes, oh, I can see. Yours, you know, having the same troubles as we are. So we'll show you how to make stone soup. And the mayor goes, stone soup? If we can make stoop, soup from stones, we'll never go hungry. And at this time, other villagers are starting to come into the town. And, um, and then the, the soldier goes, please, we'll show you how to do this. Just get started, get the largest pot you have, put it in the middle of the town square, build a fire around it, put some water in it, and we'll take care of the rest. So they go, all right, this sounds easy to do. So they grab the pot, put the water, build the fire. The soldiers go out into the field and spend time and care finding three stones to bring back. And by this time, all the village is gathered around. What's going on? And the first soldier drops the stone in. Then the second soldier drops the stone in. And then the third soldier drops the stone in. And they're all waiting and saying, what's going to happen? And then the first soldier goes, you know, if we only had a little bit of cabbage, it would really make this soup wonderful. And one of the villagers goes, oh, I have some cabbage. They run home, take it out, chop it up, bring it in. They put it in the soup and they go, he's right. You can even smell it. And then the second soldier goes, if we only had a little bit of salt and pepper, it would really help out. And then another villager goes, I have that. Let me run home, gets it, pulls it out, puts it in the soup. And then the third soldier goes, if we only had a little beef, and then it goes around, little potatoes, carrots, and extra. And by the end of the day, they had this magnificent stew. And then the mayor goes, this is amazing. Let's celebrate bring out the tables and everyone, whether you contribute or not, come enjoy our stone soup. And they celebrated and they enjoyed the evening and the soldiers got put up in the nicest beds in town. And the next morning they went out and said, thank you so much. And we're so glad you were able to enjoy stone soup. And then they went off. So the story when I heard it a long time ago, and now when I think about how do we change in higher education, there's a metaphor and there's a set of principles to how do you enable innovation to occur. 
And, and when we look through this, the first part is how do we engage people and have them open their doors? And sometimes it's getting faculty out of their office or out of their homes to see something new. And then, then the soldiers had to validate the needs. Oh, you're hungry too. And what can we do to help get you ready for something? Now, the critical aspect here was exciting curiosity. When someone says, how do you make stone soup, right? It's saying, this is a real question that I want to know about. And in a sense, creating a demand, oh, I want to be involved. I want to participate. And then they had to create a gathering place, right? Put the pot in the middle of the town. They didn't put it hidden away someplace. And then this is the really critical element about inviting solutions. And I think when we, what uh, Caroline and, and, and uh, uh, Marinda had, had, had mentioned about how do you invite students to participate in opening up that process and what the risks might be involved. And again, inviting solutions that allow personal contributions, right? The soldiers didn't say, hey, you go get the cabbage. They said, what do you have? And someone volunteered that process of contributing. And all this was encouraging publicity, saying the visibility of making this soup available and then celebrating, enjoying the fruits of the labors, celebrating the accomplishments and always saying thank you. So these kind of the story brings up strategies for when you're trying to bring an open strategy or a caring framework or whatever the innovation you're bringing in. These can be very important to guide your process. And, and what are the open educational services, in a sense, coming back to the food analogy, the kitchen that you need to help build all these things to occur? So the first part, engaging people in opening doors. And that's what OE Global Conference is all about, is bringing people together so you can have that opportunity to begin to share and contribute and collaborate and what we do in Merlot too as well. We have a conference coming up in March. You're, everyone's welcome to join that too as well. The next part is around validating needs. And in California, I think one of the critical elements and open education resources have many, many values. And what we focus on is really about affordability as that entry into the engagement of both students and faculty. And, and really, you have to make it about what this affordability about what students can pay. What is their economic situation? And, and sharing data that people can trust and that they don't know. And many of our faculty had no clue that about half of our students were on Pell Grants, which meant that their families had insufficient funds to cover the cost of college and 80% were on some amount of financial aid. So affordability became a huge issue for so many students completing and collecting additional data. When we found 11% of our students were homeless, this was pre-COVID and 41% experienced food insecurity, they were hungry. And so these are students in our classes and you say, how are your students going to learn when they are hungry, when they haven't had a good night's sleep, and then you're asking them to pay for a $200 textbook, right? And when you're asking them to do that, there's lots of consequences. They're not buying it, they're taking fewer courses, they're earning poor grades. And if your institution is trying to help your students graduate in a timely manner, then the issue around affordability that can be addressed with the needs uh, and the uses of open educational resources now becomes you validated the needs of, of your students. And, and now they begin to say, so what can I do about this, right? How do you excite their demand, excite their curiosity and ask them to sense, I need to solve this problem. How can I do this? And how can I find ways to inspire people to change, right? help them learn effectively, help them teach successfully, and actually help administrators achieve their goals. 
So in, in the CSU, when we have a half a billion students, if, you know, I said, if we can save them $100 per semester, that's $100 million annually, $100 in the fall, $100 in the spring, 200 a year, 500,000 students, $100 million. And that's a $100 million financial aid package that I would never get from the state of California, okay? And that's an annual benefit. And just so you know, is that achievable? Last year, the Cal State system saved $72 million for our students. So when you're asking, can you do something and can it be at scale? Yes, it can. And again, we went through this um, metaphor before, just again, when we help begin to think about now, how do I do it? What can I do with the uh, ingredients and the recipes and what are the tools that you have and what are the practices and, and sharing those um, strategies for improving student success and providing the tools to enable them to do that. Um, and when we begin to think about exciting that curiosity, when I say, Thermodynamic, thermo, thermodynamic equilibrium, you know, people go, oh my goodness. But when you can bring in kind of interactive, open educational resources that allow the students to engage and test out ideas. And since this was about cooking, I had to find something about thermodynamics and cooking, right? That begin to say, how can I apply this knowledge into things that I might be interested in that, that are important to me? So these aspects about exciting curiosity, both in the faculty, how can I make a difference? And then exciting curiosity with your students about why would thermodynamics be important to me is gonna be important. And then remember, once we excite the curiosity, then the soldier said, let's get the pot together, gathering place to bring things together. And in California with 114 campuses, uh, community colleges, 23 CSUs, 10 UCs, 100,000 faculty members, you can say, what, how are we going to bring that together? Well, we had to create the open digital library or the o OER stone soup, the pot. So in the CSU, we created this affordable learning solutions. Websites are the digital pots where people find stuff. And again, you can build the local communities but linked to the global capabilities. And in particular, we created the California Open Online Library for Education, Cool for Ed. And, and in it, we try to make sure the pot had the ingredients that people needed. Where on the website there, you can see it says faculty showcases. Those are the e-portfolios of people doing things, workforce skills tied into skills comments, stuff along those, oh, hit the wrong one. And it pulled and it drawed upon Merlot and in various ways. And I'm not gonna go through this again, but we really enabled these global repositories to then be surfaced in a local pot that was branded for their institutions. And again, bringing in skills commons resources, whether it was general education materials, we aligned them with SOC codes, which are standard occupational classifications to make it easy, convenient for people to find the OER, and then inviting solutions, motivating people to say, I can think about ways about what I can bring to the table and how you can get them to customize those solutions for themselves and how to get campus members to best, uh, you know, I'll say making it local, bringing it personal, enable them to take on their, the leadership becomes very important. And we've been doing this, and I mentioned before, we worked with uh, um, historically back colleges and universities. And if, when you look at this website, it parallels what we did in, in California and, and making, you know, we have the virtual labs, faculty showcase sharing, career and technical education. And then from that general one, then each, of the HBCUs created their own pot, in a sense, created their own branded inst institution that let them customize and curate the ingredients that they wanted to share. And looking at personal contributions, right? Someone got the cabbage, someone got the 
the um, the salt and pepper and encouraging publicity. That is, and that is around driving intrinsic motivations, driving the the personal commitment to try to do something. And you certainly can support it with some extrinsic incentives. But if you don't drive the personal reasons for it, that you want to, the empathy to care, I think you'll be missing out on something. And, and that's really an, in the Stone Soup story. The soldier said, if we only had, can you make a difference in what we can do? And people said, yeah, I can do that. They didn't have to say anything, but you drove them to, to participate. And one of the things that we are contributing here in the HBCUs, building out the Africana cultural collection within Merlot. And just for an example, um, in, in Merlot, we went from having nothing about HBCU histories, about what those institutions have done for higher education. And now we have almost 300 open education resources and free materials in the collection. And, and the HBCU faculty are building these resources um, that now it's bringing their recipes and their ingredients to the table. We've, we've talked about open educational practices, finding these, you know, these are your recipe books, giving examples, and these are the templates that we use. And I'd just like to say that the scaffold, the prompts that uh, Carolyn and Marinda brought out, very important in guiding. And this is why these templates, we have scaffolding prompts of, you know, provide a description of the book, provide a description of, of, of the, the course that you teach. And, and I think one of the things I got from um, Car Caroline and Marinda is, how do we have to add more empathy prompts, caring prompts into these e-portfolios? So enjoying the fruits of labor, celebrating accomplishments, it's party time. Um, in my role, when I was assistant vice chancellor, whenever I gave out money, I said, part of the requirements is you had to celebrate, you had to throw a party at the end of the year of people's accomplishments. And, and again, these are some, this is a pre-COVID example. You say, can faculty really come to the table? And this is uh, Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. Um, it's a very diverse uh, campus and, you know, over half the faculty participated in the affordable learning solutions and shared on their website, sharing what, what they've done. At Bethune Cookman, within two years, they moved all their general education courses, except for a biology lab at the time, and, and I, I think by this time they've done it, to have no cost for those student courses. Um, Eastern Gateway, a community college in Ohio that has a free, uh, college education program. Um, and within two years, we work with them to convert 200 courses that saved collectively $22 million over that. Okay. So celebrating these accomplishments is a critical process, particularly, particularly for, as you move up for administrators. And this is just kind of a, a quick, this is my ABCs chart of pulling all these things. What do you have to manage is aggregating your assets. What are all the resources and people and services available? Building bridges between siloed groups, between librarians and your faculty development center and your CIO and your learning management system. Building those bridges that typically don't talk to create technical capabilities to make it easy and convenient for people. Developing the demand with, um, training and communication and enabling ecosystems with policies and leadership and administration. So with that, you know, sometimes you feel like you're there trying to change the world by yourself with the ideas that you have, but like stone soup, if you say collectively, how can we each provide the resources, the ingredients, the recipes, then we can really change the world. So with that, just want to say thank you very much, um, and um, and Stone Soup. It excited me when I was, you know, a young kid, probably three or four years old, at Captain Kangaroo, and it still is a is a guidebook for uh, for me as I um, in you know many many years later. 
it's the future. So with that, I'm all done. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I love that story. And it is lovely to hear a story in the midst of these kinds of uh, formal, serious um, sessions. Um, so, um, okay. We have reached the end of the formal presentation part. And now this is the stage where we open it up really to invite all of you to ask questions, to share thoughts. I, I've been finding this whole conference this year pretty remarkable for the, I don't know, it sort of feels like the whole field has become really mature and much more thoughtful and careful about how it describes what it's doing. And um, I, I mean, maybe I'll start by just saying, every time I see these numbers on essentially student savings, I'm struck by the incredible return on investment of open education. It seems to me that certainly in the US context, especially that the investments being made in open education, you know, are, are achieving an incredible return. Um, and it makes me wonder why uh, there isn't larger and more investments being made when you're getting those kinds of returns. Um, but please let me stop, let me not talk. <laughs> I wanna invite all of you to ask questions of Jerry or Carolina, Marinda, or even just share your own reflections on what's been presented. Eric is liking the storytelling part and I'm not surprised. I was just um, gonna to respond to your comment, Paul, and say I'm always struck um, as you are by the amount that can be saved for students um, through open educational efforts and, and OER and especially the incredible work that community colleges um, do in particular for those of us working in the US, just community colleges are just a constant inspiration. They just go for it and they make huge strides in this area. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm gonna come back to Asita's question which was asked earlier in the chat. And this is really, I think for you, Jerry, it, it was pertaining to your kitchen analogy. And the question was in your kitchen analogy, where do you see policy? Um, those are the health regulations that we all have to follow <laughs> to make sure we deliver things well, right? I, I mean, I, um, and, 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 I, and I mean that seriously, is that, um, that um, in order for, um, I'll say multiple kitchens, uh, for restaurants to serve food um, and, um, um, th there has to be some some guidance um, that the the wisdom of the past can be shared with the innovators of the future, right? And that's really what I, I look at with with policy is is a chance where human beings get a chance to benefit from um, people's broad collective thinking and say, here's something that could be good for, for us that we all don't have to discover it on our own, okay? So, um, and, and, and in the, you know, in the uh, cooking, you know, metaphor, I mean, it, I think it, it can be about how do we make sure that, um, um, you know, the way we serve up these, um, these open education resources follow certain guidelines of policies that enable them to be effectively used or that, well, here I'll say, Paul, your question about why don't we do affordability more? It's like, uh, honestly, um, and, and I've worked for many years with legislators and, and uh, you know, um, there's like four or five bills that I've been on the scene to try to get in California that are now making a difference that have enabled major policy shift and one of the things, um, and I saw Una Daly on, on the, on, she's here too, is that the California Community Colleges now got a legislative or governor allocation of $115 million to support uh, zero textbook cost initiatives, right? And, and I, I think it's the, 
the development of these policies and legislation over time that enabled it to become a visible societal strategy, not an individual choice thing. So I, 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 I yapped along there, I apologize, <laughs> but, but it, policy does make a very important um, play in this, to, if, it's gonna, if we're gonna have impact at scale. Right. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. And I, I, I have more questions for you, but I would also want to invite questions for Marinda and Caroline. So does anyone have a question or reflection that they would like to bring forward regarding the deeply thoughtful care framework? Um, if you don't mind, Caroline, Marinda, um, oh, oh, Caroline, oh, Catherine, you, you go ahead. <laughs> I have a question, but then by all means, Jerry, uh, you follow. Um, I, I was looking at it. I remember your work from last year. I wasn't lucky enough to be in the live session last year, but I remember catching up with the work afterwards. So thank you so much. Um, I would love to know, because you're so immersed in this and it has developed so much over the past year, you know, just what the process looks like in terms of, you know, you working with you know, faculty and staff and, and students and so on. I would just love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, I, I plan on digging into the framework that you shared um, some more, but I would just love to know a little bit more of kind of maybe the story um, about how it's been going. Would you like to start, Carolyn? Um, sure. Um, if, if I understand correctly, I think um, where we've been so far is, as we mentioned, were these initial pilot interviews just to kind of test out how that might work and what some initial responses might be. Our next phase is to recreate a, a wider, wider breadth of educators on our campus as a start, um, and our hope is to include graduate students as well as instructors and tenure track faculty to get a wide breadth of experience and context as we were talking about, you know, the situational factors that might fit into how one could respond to the framework, and then to do some deeper analysis of those responses that we see um, in a more in depth way, identifying those themes and so on. And I think from our initial um, pilot interviews, we also, I could imagine us doing other iterations that do speak specifically to whether you're using it for a personal individual purpose or you're using it in a communal setting, or if there are other ways to sort of scaffold someone into it on a piece by piece um, uh, process or something of that kind. I don't know if I'm getting to your question though, Catherine. So um, please let me know if I'm not in Marinda. I'm not sure, would you like to add more? <laughs> I, I would only add, I think that was wonderful. And I would only add that I don't think we envisioned the educator prompts when we started. So we really started from a place of wanting something that would help us be centered and recentered constantly in our values and what, why we were doing open education work and what we wanted to bring to that and how we wanted to do that work. So I think it's been exciting for us to, um, have it prompt our own thinking that in turn has pushed us to kind of do this next development. And I'm excited to see, because we spoke to just a very small uh, number of educators in these initial interviews, I'm really excited to see too how it does or may not resonate with different educators that we talk with in a, in a larger community. And so as Carolyn mentioned, we're hoping to um, talk to graduate students as well as future educators potentially and as people who may already be in the classroom as graduate students and involved in teaching and learning and so I'm intrigued to see if it you know if it resonates with them in different ways than it resonates with people who have deeper teaching experience or longer teaching experience too. I'll just jump in to say a few remarks from my side would be that I, when I was listening to you, it felt I felt that in some ways the kinds of principles that you're putting forward regarding care are relevant for all forms of education, but, but perhaps uniquely enabled by open education. I, and I, I just thought I'd, I'd share that. And, and then uh, two more things. One, one is that I, I always have been looking for 
institutions that are willing to adopt some kind of unique framework or pedagogical model, or in this case, a culture of care around their academic programs, particularly as it pertains to online learning, um, because it feels to me like institutions have a very strong institutional identity when their campus are physically based somewhere. The identity and character of that institution is manifested in the physical place. But when they move online, they don't actually try to migrate and uh, create a similar expression of their institutional identity in the online space. And it feels to me like the kind of frameworks that you're describing, yes, they're useful for all open educators, but I also think that they could form the basis for a very unique expression of academic culture in your context at your institution. And, and I think that would be, would be absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, I, I did wonder, and maybe this is a bit related to Catherine's comment about the kind of ability to, um, like how would you distribute this framework beyond your own institution? So, yes, okay, you've got your website, but, but in terms of a practice and a, a kind of um, a encouragement for others to adopt it, it feels like that whole aspect of the distribution and potential reuse of it by others it's further down on your roadmap, but it's fast approaching, I think. <laughs> Anyways, those are just a few thoughts from my side and really, really thoughtful and uh, wonderful work. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, and if I could um, could say one more tiny thing that came up for me as I was listening to to Jerry as well, it, and this is not a fully formed thought on my part, so um, please bear with me, but I think that also part of the framework is helping to give some texture to the narratives of people who are engaging in open and why it matters for the purpose of, Gary, what did you call it? Exciting curiosity and demand. Um, I think in some ways uh, the prompts could help individuals tell their story in a meaningful way that might be uh, compelling to other educators and, and inspiring to other educators. And then a third, um, Another thought I should say that again is not totally formed. Um, I know on our campus, there are some folks working on um, teaching quality frameworks that more robustly uh, uh, evaluate teaching so that it's not just student evaluation of teaching, but it might also include your own evaluation of your teaching as well as peer evaluation of your teaching. So there's a more fuller broad spectrum. And I could see a framework like this um, or one similar to help do that, to help kind of provide you with some prompts to give evidence and, and texture again to your teaching experiences and your teaching growth over time. So two additional prompts and then Jerry. Jerry's got his hand up. Go ahead, Jerry. So, oh, th thank you. I, um, so so the, the, the first question, um, I think it relates a little bit with Catherine said so when I, when I'm thinking about I think the prompts that you have are great and really important to get faculty to that point of reflection. Um, but when I think about when I work with engineers right and say okay when do I bring in the caring prompts, rather than them trying to try to fix the problem by engineering a learning solution, rather than making it a human you know, engagement problem. So when you ask these questions, do, do you have some, to get them warmed up to be, feel comfortable to begin to um, be able to share the affective side of the faculty persona versus the cognitive um, um, critical side of the faculty persona? I don't think we do yet, but that is a wonderful point. And I think we've been inching towards being in a place where we feel ready to actively apply the framework in groups of educators. And so 
I will, I've made a note of that point, Jerry, and, and take it away. And I think it's it's one of the things that we're thinking about is what kind of supports or wraparound um, guidance or additional information and so on, you know, would be needed to use this as a reflective tool, for example, in a community of faculty, um, whether they be engineers or, um, you know, or people in the literature department or, or wherever they may be or a mixed group. So thank you. Let's add more voices to the conversation. Who else wants to jump in on this conversation? The more voices, the better. <laughs> all right, well, I'm gonna ask another question. I've always got lots of questions. So, um, all right, so here's, Here's another thought that I had, Jerry, when I was listening to your uh, cooking metaphor. It goes a little bit back to something I was just suggesting to Carolyn and Marinda, which is, wouldn't it be cool if, if, say, the California State University system specialized in French cooking? And, um, you know, Oregon did, uh, I don't know, Mediterranean style cooking or whatever. And so, so the expression of the unique identity of the institution or the system through the methodologies that it's actually bringing forward and utilizing in its open education approach just would be wonderful. But I also was wondering what you think about something that I feel has really emerged during this COVID time. In a, in a way, we've always had fast food and perhaps, I don't know, are the publishers a form of fast food? Uh, maybe not. They're not cheap, that's for sure. Um, but I, no, but I, they, they are have... fast, though. I agree. They, they're the fast food, right? They prepare it all for you, and all you do is yeah. bring it into your classroom and consume it. And so is Merlot and what you're doing in terms of providing affordable learning solutions and things like that, do you see that as a kind of form of DoorDash, Skip the Dishes, Uber Eats? <laughs> Um, well, at, and, and here is, I, I think um, it can be, and, and, and here, when I think about change management of how to get large quantities of faculty to change their practices from going to the, you know, McGraw-Hill McDonald's and bringing the textbook in to going to your local <laughs> restaurant that um that you you you, you can <laughs> i i know i know i um, <laughs> um to, to to bring it in but 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 what 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 i think needs to happen in our open education you know i'll say movement is is that um that oer libraries are seen as farmers markets and we bring them in to create recipes that are remixed and revised for our local community so it serves their learning needs better. And, and I think part of the challenge is um, that we, we actually don't have readily available kitchens equipment to do any sort of complicated remixing and revising. Like Merlot Content Builder, we build these, they're really simple things and you can remix by taking different materials, putting together with, with the way they want. But, you know, it doesn't have tools to add on interactivity. And, and I see H5P as a open source programming application that might enable that, you know, um, that, that we go to the libraries again for the ingredients and then we build the know-how um, by through the remixing and revising. Because if all we get is fast food, then we never learn to cook, and we never yeah. learn to do what we need. And and that's I think we're still we, we haven't moved to um, you know uh, we're still college students going out for pizza. We we haven't learned to be seniors where we don't have any money and we have to cook our own food. So. Sorry, I, I don't There's know if that very, <laughs> People are really playing off this metaphor and so I just share a few things like, yeah. are, are the publishers really Michelin-starred Michelin restaurants delivering the whole package and learning experience 
And then, and as Jim points out, the, you know, the large scale numbers with the unchanged resource, the more you're becoming sort of institutional food. Um, and, and Una likes the farmer's market analogy. I think there is a great observation that there's kind of trade-offs happening here with all these approaches. And, and I, I think that's true. I, I, I sometimes wonder whether the publishers really aren't a form of freeze dried. Um, you know, where you just you just add the students, that's the water and you're good to go, <laughs> as opposed to fast food because of the fixed form of it. Um, but another phenomenon that certainly has been part of life here in Vancouver is you now have, in addition to the Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes and sort of delivery services bringing you uh, food from a restaurant, you also now have these like uh, people who are delivering to you the ingredients for a set of meals to make over the course of a week. And so you get a food kit, if you will. It's not yet been made into a meal, but they prepare and provide you with the necessary ingredients and even the recipes associated with you know, creating the dish. And I, th I think these are all really fun. Um, and yes, Alan, you wanna speak about H5B Kitchen Open Ed? Oh no, not really. Just that. No, uh, okay. <laughs> just, just, just that. That you know, I I follow yeah, you know, yeah. Gary Good Mind think, but um, yeah. also the idea that um, it's messy too, um, and and there's an element of experimentation, um, and, and also the idea of um, most people recognize kitchens are like the social gathering space in their home. So those are all environments that that I like to invoke um, for this idea about um, what we do with these OERs. Um, instead of grind one, go. One of the things that sort of just went through my head when when Jerry was talking about the ability to, you know, how a lot of the platforms are on right now don't really have the ability to kind of uh, remix things in in the the format that they're on, like um, like easily. Uh, and one platform that I've discovered kind of more on the younger kids version that is actually doing that really well is uh, this platform called Elementary. And so uh, I'll write it in the chat because on, on a kid's level, it's really, well, I, I have to admit because I like the animations and stuff in it, I might be using it myself too. Um, but but it, it's uh, one of the things they're doing there too is really encouraging teachers to start using, well, it was created for kids to start building interactive um, stories. Uh, they're now actually encouraging teachers to also use it to build their their lesson plans and then have then creating that ability then for uh for those lesson plans from teachers to get remixed and it's all all working on um you know sort of a creative commons uh framework over there so i'll i'll write in there um and the, the woman who's running it, well, she and her husband are running it. Her name's Nicole. And uh, she, she's, she's all, like, she's a ball of energy. She's, um, she's always happy to, to chat with people and, and share what it is that they're doing. Okay, anyone else want to jump in on um, how open education is like cooking? or the importance of care. Uh, it feels to me from my view um, that the best meals I've ever had were made with a lot of love and care. And so these are not mutually excludable ideas. I think in some ways they combine in a wonderful way. Yeah. Paul, if I could say um, the other thing is sometimes people don't like certain recipes, right? And some people do. And so this gets down to how do you determine the quality of open education resources, which is, you know, um, people have different needs. And, and I think that that's another, when people start debating, oh, OER, you know, look at this, it doesn't have the quality that I like, but they don't, they always leave off of the I like, right? It doesn't have quality and therefore it's not any good. So I think that there are, um, you know, it, yeah. it it can it can help um, flush out issues that allows greater acceptance for.
for whatever someone is creating, it can bring value to them because that's they like peanut butter and bananas or whatever it is, right? And you might say, ah, how could I ever that? But, you know, some people like that, right? And so Jim likes that. <laughs> over, over to you, Jim. Go ahead. Well, you know, they, they, we can always push a metaphor too far. And I'm, <laughs> I'm famous for doing that, I will admit. But I, I really love this, you know, the cooking metaphor here. And part of it is, and, and I'm wondering, you know, what we were just talking about there, the it's not just the taste of the students, but if we think about what we serve up, the course experience, and by course experience, I mean, you know, the, the actual, we do this and then, you know, they go through, what are they experiences they're trying to learn in our course? Um, everybody's got different nutritional needs. And, you know, the ability to revise and remix gets us to the care, some of the care, um that the others were talking about because you know there's there's no way you can write a book or even you know lay out a course or a syllabus for a huge number of people without you know homogenizing everybody and in each location um I've taught at two community colleges in Michigan, for example. One of them's here in Dearborn, where we have a 60% Middle Eastern uh, Arabic descended uh, population, uh, the largest concentration in, in uh, the United States. The, the needs, they're subtle. But the needs to change things because, you know, they haven't had most of those students or larger numbers of those students haven't had the same English experience that my students elsewhere in Lansing have had or, you know, those kinds of things. And the ability to adapt to that, it's like it's a form of care to to make this easier, better, more relatable so that you know, it, it can, um, to help everybody. I really, really love this metaphor. <laughs> when we get into that with, um, like, it's, it's actually been a, a big area that I've been thinking about is uh, that care around accessibility and also, like, um, really sort of tailoring things for, for accessibility. So much of what I see that goes into, um, you know, those movements within institutions is this prescribed, this is what accessibility is. And so this is what we'll do for our students. Now, I, I've sort of, you know, had the uh, firsthand experience of dealing with, um, uh, you know, accessibility or sorry, um, disability issues as a master's student from a couple of car accidents. And one of the things I've you know, that it's really taught me as an educator is that when your students are approaching, um, you know, that, that possibly have accessibility issues, what works for one person, even with the same disability does not necessarily work for somebody else. And so I know, and I was hoping to do this as a part of my master's, um, but it, it'll be something I do after master's or, or during, but separately from it. Um, but is this idea of, of kind of building, um, you know, sort of resources around that approach to involving the, uh, the student in the accessibility decision. So, so the, the whole idea of, and I sort of was kind of one that I put out at the last um, OE Global Conference is, is, are you asking? Like, cause I think, so often we forget to ask it just it goes to the same thing of how we're um of, of now even like you know asking our students too about you know how they'd like to be referred to in their pronouns i think the same thing goes when it comes to these accessibility matters is 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 actually you know and, and, and we're not you know, we're, we're, we're not all magicians that can fix everything and make everything perfect, but at least if we know, uh, then, then we can kind of approach with, with uh, people's various accessibility needs um, uh, in hand, or we can even reach out to our accessibility centers at the school and, and say, hey, I've got a student that's got these needs. Can you give me some help to, 
you know, make things more accessible for them. Yeah, that's such a great point, Erica. And just what you have just said, and Jim, what you're talking about just brings to my mind just the whole notion of structural inequalities and that we can't just rely on care provided by individual educators to, you know, to address those. So there's this constant tension, isn't there? And I, I know this is something, Miranda and Carol, Caroline, that you have thought about. And I'm thinking also of um, Mia Zamora and Mahabali's, they did a care equity matrix, you know, looking at a lot of these issues. So, you know, if we, if we recognize that there are structural inequalities and yes, care is required as we deal with individual students, we also need kind of what um, uh, was mentioned earlier about policy and structures to support the educators, you know, to, to give that care and to, to tailor things as they need to be. But it's a, it's a dance, it's a tension, it's something, you know, it's part of the work really, isn't it? Yeah, I really like that comment because this is a, an area of interest that I've had too, Catherine, which is, it's one thing to expect our faculty to be engaged in providing care, but if they themselves don't feel cared for, it can create some, it can be very difficult because, you know, you, you need, it's ideally you provide care from a place of being cared for yourself. And so mm -hmm. to what extent are we creating in our educational institutions and systems, a culture of care or, as my staff will know who are here at this webinar, I've been really working hard at trying to create a culture of care within open education global. What does that look like? How do we essentially embed it in our DNA such that we kind of walk the talk and are able to affirm that we ourselves are kind of existing in a culture of care? These kinds of questions are really deep and really challenging, I find, but still really important. Well, in their, well, I think they're extra important too, because you're, you're hitting on a lot of post-secondary institutions. And, and let's be real about things here. Like there is a lot of unhealthy um, systems in place in a lot of post-secondary schools. It, uh, the number of, of students that you see drop out of programs because of, of, of that unhealthy, like, the bullying that goes on and, and that doesn't just happen to students it also happens bullying between different uh different uh you know faculty and uh and, and staff in institutions and i mean i know you know this is part of that whole thing that laurie and i are getting into with building those resources out there is there's got to be a change that starts to happen and i i think on some levels, we're we're seeing seeing it, but on other levels, it's 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 just as bad, if not worse. Than it, you know, it's uh, and I don't know how how we sort of spark that um, that movement of change, but but I think it gets in the way of people learning. It gets in the way of progress too and innovation. These are tough questions, and and I will just say that I find sometimes, um, yeah, it, it it I think it, there have been times when, as a movement and and as professional peers and colleagues, we are anti a lot of things. Where we don't like this, we don't like that. We this is a problem. That's a problem. Um, and and I think somehow we also need to uh, add to that, complement with that what we are for and what we want to see and come up with the new rules that we expect or hope will be enacted as part of what we're trying to accomplish um, and not become uh, simply like complainers. <laughs> Jerry, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, and just following up with, with Erica's point here too and, and Paul, yours is, um, you know, higher education institutions, their hierarchy can sometimes support authoritarian management strategies and care is about a shared governance strategy. And, and higher education has a poor history of having effective shared governance. And, and I think that's, 
you know, if we're looking about, you know, how do we set policies that actually translate into practices where, where you care about what other stakeholders think in how you're managing an organization. And, um, and I, you know, people know I have, a, I have some sayings and, and, and one of them is um, authoritarian management magnifies incompetencies, right? And, and because the, another one is the glory of one mind is never sufficient. It, it really takes the complexity of our problems require many people to contribute to the solution. And, um, and, and the way higher education is structured with presidents, provosts, and they have power and authority organized, it doesn't always lead to um, good shared governance unless you have the personality of someone in there who begins to violate tradition. So I just, you know, er Erica's point um, is, is it, we're gonna, it's gonna be difficult to really create institutional care when you have significant power differentials in how decisions get made. And so, so this is a really good question really for Caroline and Marinda from my perspective, and that is what's been the reception to your care framework at your institution? Are people embracing it and celebrating it and encouraging you to do more or is it threatening and you're getting pushback? What's been the response? We haven't gotten to that stage yet, Paul. So we, we've been still in development and um, just sharing it through presentations like this as we've iterated. So I think we'll be really interested to see once we begin applying it and actively using it with groups of educators um, and others that we work with, you know, what is their response and what, what will that lead us to do um, in terms of refinement and change? Yeah. And just to say, I, I really am uh, grateful for all the comments we're hearing, though, um, the, these questions of, of structural um, inequities and in power have definitely been on our minds as we've been working with the framework um, and the emotional labor that that care often means for educators. And, and I'm just so glad to hear Catherine mention uh, Mia and Maha's uh, matrix as well, because uh, these are questions we're still grappling with and, and finding ways to explore further as we move forward and bring it to our institution, Paul. Um, and we can let you know when we do. <laughs> yeah, but. I wonder if you can also share a few remarks on how you, like, there is another care framework, as I'm sure you're aware of, that was developed by other colleagues in the open education space, including Lisa Petridis and others. And so, but it, it presents a very different kind of context for care. And it's, it seems to me that there's some, you know, dramatic differences in terms of how the two of you are approaching care. But I wonder how you see your work fitting into that care framework if that's not a fair question. <laughs> well, I think Jim, Jim, you worked on that framework, didn't you? Um, so I, I wonder if we could hear from Jim too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I didn't work on the framework per se, huh. but um, when it came out, yeah, I was, I was part of the, the it, it got some pushback, I think yeah. from David Wiley in particular and some others. And I was part of the, uh, uh, it struck me as a very, uh, as a good framework, uh, particularly if we were thinking about open education resources and the commons that creates and stewards those resources. Um, I think there's a little bit of difference between that framework and, and what you were presenting today in that what I was hearing in what you are presenting today is, is more of a education as a, a care framework for education, as yeah. opposed to specifically the commons of the educational resources. Does that make, you know, because the, the education's more than just these collections of resources. So in that sense, I don't know that these are, these are either competitive or in any way, conflictual 
conflictual. Is that a word? Uh, <laughs> it's now. <laughs> um, creating new words and extending metaphors. Um, so I, I like both of them, and I think we need to keep pushing on these. I think the intersection of the two kinds of frameworks is the commonality is that they both push us towards if, if we're going to maintain or survive as a commons and this would be probably my contribution from the economic side as to what makes a commons work is it it has to have a degree of care and reciprocity built into it and you don't get reciprocity through rules and, and laws, you get it through social and community standards that build trust. So in other words, I will let you use this stuff because I, I, I recognize a bond between us. It doesn't mean we're the same. And that means that I, you know, and, and because I expect that you would do the same for me. And that to me is a key part of care. Now there's parts of care that I think are broader than just what commons would, would call. But I think both of these kinds of, you know, thinking of it for education and then also how do you maintain the resources? Yeah. And, I, and I would just quickly add to that when we're talking about care and in this set of presentations, a kind of a care framework um, I have been finding it just hugely wonderful to see the, the range of frameworks that are emerging, including Cheryl Hodgkins and Williams' social justice framework. You know, there's elements of care that are embedded in that as well, from my point of view. And, and it feels like there's a bunch of kind of collective thought going around this that I really do hope coalesces into something that people will be curious and inspired by and want to be part of. And we have time for maybe just a couple more questions or comments. Does anyone, you know, really have something they want to say that they haven't said or share kind of closing insights? Oh, come on. I was just going to say it's 11 p.m. here and I'm probably not making sense anymore. So I just want to say thank you before I fall off my chair here. <laughs> it's so nice that you stayed. It's just, it's been amazing. I mean, I can't believe that was two hours. It was just, just, you know, sparking so many ideas. So thanks to everybody for presentations, questions, conversation, and hope to pick it up with uh, at least some of you following this. Yeah. I agree with what you just said there, Paul. So. <laughs> thank you. So thanks. <laughs> Well, look, let's yeah. let's wrap things up here. I think this is a good point to, uh, to to simply say how wonderful it is to have the opportunity to engage in these conversations with you all. Uh, it really is one of the amazing treats associated with these convenings, and I, I deeply appreciate it every time it happens. And so, thank you all for being part of today's session. Thank you to the presenters and to all of you for the uh, contributions you've made through chat, through your questions and through your reflections. It's really been great. Okay, so I'll let you all go. We can stop the recording.